Hey, good morning, everyone. My name's Ben. Welcome to Four Corners. A special welcome to all of our guests. As Pastor Joseph told you in that video, if you'll give us your name and your address on your Connect card that was on your seat when you sat down, put it in the offering bucket at the end of our service. We'll send you some free Chick-fil-A. And I would love to meet you with my wife standing right out in the lobby right after the service. Hey, there's some folks on the stage with me. You uh, don't maybe recognize all of them. One of them you met in the video just a moment ago. This is Josh and his wife, Megan Power. They are our new kids pastors here at 4C. Can we give it up for them? Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you a little bit about them, and then get you a chance to hear from Josh for just a second. So uh, weeks ago, weeks ago, um, six, seven weeks ago, I started having conversations about Josh. Um, I'm always looking for great team members, potential team members. And um, so we were talking about a potential position here at 4C. And um, some cool things about Josh um, that made me very interested in him is um, when he was in high school, his pastor is a gentleman by the name of Harold Bear in Charlottesville, Virginia, where uh, Josh um, grew up. Josh is one of 11 children, youngest of 11. You can hear his story in a few weeks. You're going to just be wowed by what God did there. But um, Pastor Bear's son, Danny, was a friend of mine in college. And so Danny was at my wedding. We were not just mutual like acquaintances. We were friends, friends. So I, got, I know a little bit about this guy through his pastor from years ago. But in the last five years, Josh was serving at a church called A2 Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where he met the lovely Megan. Um, and um, he was the student pastor there. And Josh built an incredible team. And the pastor he served under, his name is Pastor Chris. And Pastor Chris's mentor, one of them, is one of my mentors. So we know each other pretty well. So I had a chance to really kind of vet this guy. But what's really cool about Josh uh, as well is, is that he is a graduate of Lee University, the Lee University, which is where I went to school. So he had great marks there. Uh, Megan, on the other hand, sorry, uh, she graduated from the Uni University of Alabama at Birmingham with a marketing degree. But Josh, tell everybody what you uh, majored in a double major in youth ministry and psychology. Yeah. And over the last five years, Josh has served as a student pastor. And what he did really, really well was he built an incredible team um, from nothing to awesomeness. And uh, one of the things I'm most excited about with Josh, we've talked about it multiple times. In fact, just this morning, I said to him, Josh, what are you most excited about coming on to the team? And you said? Uh, building an incredible team. Yeah, building an incredible team. That's what he does. And that's what we were praying for, for another position. And then when our children's pastor transition happened, um, it gave us an opportunity to accelerate an opportunity for Josh. You might be interested to know that his other claim to fame is he is a frat brother and a roommate to Pastor Joseph when they were in college. So we're not going to hold the frat brother thing against him. The Lord saves and redeems. But he was a roommate to Pastor Joseph, and that's the other way we've gotten to know him. We're really, really, really stoked and excited. What Josh is going to do for the next couple months is kind of get to know our system he doesn't have to start from scratch here. We have some incredible things in place. He also will get to know our volunteers, our kids, and our parents. Those are the kind of three groups of people that we connect with here on our kids team. He'll learn some of the ways we do things here in our church and some of our core values as staff. So all that will be happening. And then in a few months, after he's had a chance to do some learning and some relationship building, he will begin to pray with our management team about where he wants to take um, the kids' ministry. And uh, we're always excited when new people join the team where they believe God would have them go. And if you're a parent in our kids' ministry, um, you're going to love this. It's going to be phenomenal. Josh, um, how can we as a church pray for you on this uh, front end of your ministry? I'd say the big thing is just the transition and that God would be with us and, and uh, be, just be a huge part of that. And then also just moving forward that he would guide our steps and uh, bring about the volunteers that he would have to to take us to the next step, take us to the next level. Yeah. Transitions are important. Uh, the good news is, is you get to start strong. There's some great people here. You're going to love your team. And uh, they have a heartbeat for our kids. It's going to be phenomenal. And uh, Megan, we're really glad that you're here as well. Megan does a job similar to my wife. Uh, she works from home. She works for a competitor, so we only marginally like her right now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're really, really thrilled that the Lord has brought you guys here. You're an answer to prayer for us. And it's interesting that while this other conversation was happening over here, a door opens over here. And I just found the Lord does that sort of thing. So we're really, really glad you're here. Can you give it up one more time for our new kids pastor? Yeah, we're so glad you're here. <clears throat> um, the other person on the stage with me is uh, Felix. Many of you know Felix because you have served at the New Life Mission in Hamilton. Right down 129, make a left at the McDonald's and go straight. 
and uh, that is where the New Life Mission is located. They are a strategic partner of our church, and we've given some volunteer hours as well as some money to help Felix feed the homeless and do other things as well uh, in, in Hamilton. So, uh, Felix, how are things going at the mission? Um, we've been working with you for a while now. How's it going? It's going good, actually. Um, you know, we've still got some hurdles that we've got to get over, but everything's moving in the right direction, and having groups like Four Corners come along, that really helps a lot, and cool. we really appreciate it. So um, you, about two years ago now, you became the executive director. You took a, a ministry that was in some ways struggling, and you've been turning. One really cool thing about this guy here, I, I, I think it's noteworthy. So um, I've had a chance to sit in a few meetings with him, and uh, he shared with me his heart to to uh, lead the ministry better in a more effective way. So he hired and recruited some very sharp people to sit at a table with him and say, here's some things you can do, Felix, to get the ministry more effective in, the, in serving the, this community and to grow your leadership capacity. And whenever you get a chance to sit with a leader who says, my heart is open, I'm willing to learn, I'm still learning, um, that's the table you want to sit at. And so we're thrilled as a church to partner with you in what you're doing. About how many people a month are you guys serving? Just give us that brief overview real quick. Yeah, we serve about 3,000 hot meals each month, and then around 900 or so through the food pantry with the groceries. Which is incredible. And so all that happens on a shoestring budget, and uh, we've given some money to both to Felix because we believe in leadership, and leadership, I believe, is often the gift that makes ministries move forward. Uh, we also given some money to the New Life Mission, and so you guys are a part of that, feeding people right uh, down the road from us. We say it this way at our church. We do ministry here in our church. We serve people. I'm going to tell you a story about that a little bit later. We serve people near, here, near, and so that's the Hamilton Mission. And then we go far as well. We're in India. We're in Cuba. And in just two weeks, I'm going to tell you the stories next week. In just two weeks, uh, I'm going with a group of people from this church to our orphanage and church planting ministry in India, and I have some specific things I want you to help me pray for when we get there, but Felix is the primary partner we have for serving near, right here in our own backyard, the hungry, um, but there's a specific event coming up on your church, or on church calendar, on your ministry calendar that uh, you want to invite us to be a part of. Tell everybody about that. Okay, on September 8th, we've got a golf outing. It's, a, it's one of two of our main fundraisers that we do. We do a fall banquet and then the golf outing in the summer. So um, it's going to be a Twin Runs golf course, September 8th, 1 o'clock. Uh, the, the fee, which is, or the, it's $75 a person per ticket, and that covers your green fees, and it covers a golf cart, a meal afterwards, door prizes, and um, any range of golfer is welcome. I mean, And so um, you guys do shoestring budget, so this is the primary fundraiser. We would love to see a bunch of people from Four Corners, even if you don't know how to golf, if you have a golfer friend, um, next step C at the end of the message, you can check in. I'll send you all the information about this golf event, and uh, you'll be able to just go right online, log, log on. But he, here's for Four Corners. Here's, here's my heart on this thing. Um, I want to help these people, and I want to participate with them. And so I'd love to see 12 teams of four from our church. Don't know if we'll hit it, but that's what I'm praying for and shooting for. But um, that's a Saturday event. On Sunday, if one of our Four Corners teams has won the event, on Sunday, I'll personally buy ice cream uh, and some treats for everybody here, because when Four Corners goes, we play to win, all right? And so, even if you stink, you're welcome to, but I'd love to see four of you who are very, very good get together and sweep this thing, all right? And if we don't win, don't bother coming to church. I'm too embarrassed to be your pastor, all right? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Felix, we're so proud, honestly, to partner with you. Um, we're proud to partner with you in a formal way with volunteers. We have a big serve coming up. Folks just heard about that. We're proud to partner. I, the other day I was at your building and I saw some of the um, flower, or not flower, but vegetable boxes that some of our people built and rehabbed and there's stuff coming through. The rain's got to help all that. But I'm thrilled that you are faithful to the ministry that God's put on your heart and that we get to partner with you. How can our church pray for you these days? Well, as we move forward and we look at strategic planning, that's, that's a big way you can continue to pray for how we can better serve our community and also for volunteers. Yeah. I'm always looking for volunteers. So you actually have openings through the daytime when a lot of people are at work. So um, there's, you need some drivers to like go pick up food. They just, yeah. And you have a vehicle. They just have to go pick it up. And we'll supply help. Some help so they don't even have to like lug a bunch of groceries. 
They just literally have to drive a vehicle. And then there's some work to do in the office as well. So if you have any interest in that, when you check next step C about this golf outing, even if you're not interested in that, I'll send you some more information that maybe you can help Felix out if that interests you at all. And uh, they are on the ground being the hands and feet of Jesus, and they allow our church to do that as well. We're really, really thrilled to partner with you. Would you give it up for Felix? Yeah, thank, thank you, you all Felix. for your support. <clears throat> well, we're in a series called Seven, and we're looking at the seven churches of Revelation, Revelation chapter two and three. If you want to go to chapter three right now, you can follow along. Now, I've got to tell you that your message notes have the sermon notes in them, but they are not applicable today. Um, it's the second time in a number of years that I just. Um, washed the whiteboard and started over. So the passage is correct. Nothing else is. Try your best to follow along, all right? So um, if you take any of the next steps today, I'll send you all of my notes for those type A people like me who are a little nervous that we're not following the notes today, all right? So when I was in college, uh, I had a clock like this, not this one. The clock I had like this was a wind-up clock, a mechanical clock. And in the morning when I needed to get up and go to class, no matter how long I'd been up the night before, no matter how much I'd hang, hung out with my friends, no matter how much homework I'd put off until the night before it was due and stayed up late doing it, this is what I would hear every morning. Now that noise right there is aggravating. That's frustrating. But what I realized about myself is, is that if I had stayed up really late, this sat by my bed, when the alarm would go off, I would just reach over and hit the stop button. Now, this was a mechanical clock, and it didn't have one of those nice little snooze features, you know, like the nine-minute snooze like your iPhone has. didn't have that. So when you turned it off and you went back to sleep, you're in trouble. That's what happened with this clock. So here's what I learned to do. I learned to set it on the other side of the room from my bed. When the alarm would go off, I would have to get up and go over and turn it off. So by the time I got up, most of the time I was good enough awake then to kind of go about my day. I hate that noise. I absolutely hate it. And here, here's why. Because it roused me from my slumber. It made me deal with the fact that I hadn't gotten enough sleep. It kind of cat up. I mean, this is not a pleasant little song that like, I, my iPhone is set for. This is a blaring, aggravating alarm. Except when I think more deeply about it, that's a, it's a wonderful sound. Because it's the sound that got me up to make sure that the thing I really wanted to do, which was finish school, do it well, get my degree, get on with life, it's the very sound that made me capable to do that, to meet the deadlines, to get up and go to class. It's a love and hate kind of thing. I both hate the sound and I'm grateful for it, that this aggravating nuisance of a noise helped me to do the thing that in my heart I really, really wanted to do. Today we're going to look at a letter from Jesus to a church, and it's interesting that I'm holding an alarm clock because twice in this letter Jesus is going to tell this church to wake up. In effect, this letter serves as a kind of stark, direct, very clear alarm to a church. In some ways, even though we're going to read it in English, it was written in Greek, it's going to really sound like this. This whole letter is going to sound like this. And depending on the way you're wired or depending on where you are, it will either aggravate you or you'll look a little deeper and it will be welcomed noise to you. So, some of you today, you're going to be affirmed in some things of your spiritual life. Others of you, I'm praying that God will challenge you. For our church, we get a chance to do something that you get to see on TV all the time. Some of you like the uh, CSI TV shows, you know, all 32 varieties of it. CSI Miami, CSI Seattle, CSI DC, CSI Polk County, Tennessee. Uh, they don't have that yet, but they will eventually. You don't even know what Polk County is. It's a small little county right near where I grew up that nobody really lives in. But on CSI, here's what happens. Somebody would die, and then the show kind of gets into full force. And the stars of the show would walk up. There would be a body covered with a sheet. And they would start taking forensic evidence. They would look at the blood spatter. They would look at the wounds. They'd look under the fingernails. They'd pay attention. They, they'd take the body back. They'd autopsy the body. They would do chemical analysis on the skin and on the blood. And when they were done, the science of the autopsy would often give clue to what happened to the person. 
And that would reveal how that person went from living to dead and typically who did it and why and when. And that's the science of the show. This letter for us to the church at Sardis from Jesus through the Apostle John as he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. It is our opportunity to do an autopsy on a sleeping or the other word Jesus uses in this letter is dead church. We get to pull back the sheet, test the skin, figure out what's going on, look at the chemical composition of the blood, and say, this is how a church dies. And not just a church, because you understand when we talk about the church, we're not talking about an organization. We're not talking about a building. We're talking about a group of people. This is how a group of people who are following Jesus die. This is how they're ineffective in their mission. This is how the work of God that's supposed to happen in a group of people called disciples stops happening. And we get to look at it not at ourselves. We get to look at what happened to Sardis. We get to read this letter from Jesus that's pretty pointed. There's not much great stuff in this letter said to Sardis. Most all the other letters have some good stuff in them. This one kind of jumps straight into the harsh direct speech from Jesus about their current situation. It's like that alarm clock at 6.30 in the morning. That's what it's like. And if you'll let it, I think that it'll speak to you about God's church in general. It'll show you his heart for his church because he only sets the alarm for them to wake up because he cares about them. It'll show you his heart for his church. But if you, if you look a little deeper, it might show you his heart for you. Because when we talk about the church, we're really talking about you, if you're a follower of Jesus. You may not have thought about it, but when you got saved, you got Jesus and you got his church too. You got Jesus and you got his bride. As you make this church your home, you know I say it this way a lot. If you come to me and say, Ben, you're awesome, but your wife, we, she really, we really don't like her. Well, you just don't get to be in my life. Because you can't get me without my wife. And in some ways, I know it's not popular, and it's popular to say just the opposite, but in some ways, you don't get Jesus without getting his bride, the church. You get both when you give your life to Jesus and you accept the salvation he offers freely from grace. And it's really unbiblical to say that you can love Jesus and hate the church. Like, I get why you might, but it's not a biblical position. Everywhere Jesus talks about the church, there's deep love and affection, and he writes these letters in the book of Revelation to show us what he values. And with Sardis, what he wants for his church there is he wants them to wake up. Their pulse is slowing. Their breathing has gotten shallow. They're immobilized. They're about to die. Now, there are a few that are faithful, but by and large, this church is struggling. It's located, if you look on the map, that we've had the last few weeks. It's located there at number five in what we now call Turkey. And what that map doesn't show is that the area that the city of Sardis is located in is kind of an elevated plain, about 1,500 feet above sea level, and there are mountains around it. In fact, it's almost like a natural fortification. And historically, where it was placed geographically lulled some of the rulers of that city over the years, over the few hundred years before Jesus, into thinking that they were somewhat impenetrable to outside attack. They would get complacent, and then somebody would rise up and sneak into the city and create chaos. You can read a little bit about that on the side part of your message notes. And Sardis also had another reason for people to be complacent. Near Sardis, in the rivers and streams there, there were a lot of gold and silver deposits. If you have a coin in your pocket right now, you can thank Sardis because it's believed that it was at Sardis that gold and silver was first stamped ever in human history into coins for trade and commerce. They were a wealthy city. They were a safe city. They were a complacent city that had been run over more than once in war and taken over. But just around the time of Jesus' birth, a natural calamity fell on the city and earthquake hit and in an attempt to rebuild, the city borrowed a lot of money from Rome. And the interest on that money was exorbitant, and it bankrupted the city. 
And so while they were still around and there was a church in Sardis, the truth is that that city was dying. And if you were to go to that area today, you'd see these modern ruins, this first picture here, the modern ruins of Sardis. <clears throat> That's one of the temples of Sardis. You see those columns? Now, I'm not an architect, but architects love the columns at Sardis because they were some of the most ornate in all the ancient world. If you go to the Metropolitan Museum, you can see one of them located there. Ornate, often gilded with gold flake, um, just beautifully, beautifully carved as an indicator of their wealth and comfort. If you were to have visited Sardis back in the day, you would have discovered that their gymnasium, their YMCA, if you will, was six acres big, huge. That just tells us they have a little bit of time and comfort on their hands. They were geographically shielded, they thought. They were financially shielded, they thought. They had comfort and ease in lifestyle. And yet the city was dying, and most people didn't know it. And interestingly enough, the church in that city, that little group of Christians, they too were dying. They didn't know it. They were falling asleep, going into a coma, if you will. And Jesus writes them a letter to wake them up, to, as it were, turn on the alarm. And the problem is, if there's an alarm going and you don't want to wake up, it's frustrating. If there's an alarm going and you want to wake up, it's a gift. And you get to decide what this letter is for you. So, Revelation chapter 3, here's how our Bible begins. To the angel which is the messenger or the minister of the church in Sardis, right? And then Jesus is now going to transcribe through John this letter. And like in every letter, Jesus is going to start with a picture of himself. In every letter, he does. Here's something about me I want you to know. Here's a way I want you to see me. And when he does this, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, if you see me more clearly, then the words I'm going to speak, you'll be able to receive them more easily. If you see me more clearly, what I have for you will be more clear to you. And you'll be more open and receptive to it. That's why we sing worship songs around here before the message. It's not the only reason. Worship is its own valid spiritual exercise apart from what I'm about to say. But one of the reasons we do it is, is we know that if you lift your eyes to God, get a bigger picture of God in worship, then when the word of God is opened up, most people are more receptive to it. We're able to discount what's going on around us in our world and focus more on who God is. And then when his word is opened up, it becomes sharp to us like a two-edged sword running into the deepest part of who we are. And that's why Pastor Will and this uh, worship band and the tech team go to great lengths to try to create for us a distraction-free environment so that you can come in here and forget the world, look up at God for a few minutes, sing about his greatness and goodness, and then when the word of God is delivered, it can find fertile soil in your heart. That's why for some of you who, you know, you wait till the music's over, that's fine. I'm not suggesting that's a sin in any way, you know, and then you kind of come in here for the message, like, that thrills me, I'm glad. You know, if you only have to miss something, miss Will's part. You know, that's why, that's why I feel... I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, right? But it, when you do that, as long as you come in receptive, I suppose it's okay. But the reason the services are designed the way they are, it's meant to give you an opportunity to say, God, whatever you have for me, that's what I want. So Jesus is going to give a picture of himself, and I want you to pay attention to it. Here's what it says. These are the words of him, so Jesus, these are the words of Jesus, who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, Revelation speaks in metaphor. We know from Revelation chapter 1, maybe you can make a note there, Revelation chapter 1 tells us what the seven stars are. Revelation chapter 1 tells us that the seven stars are the seven leaders of those individual churches. They're not stars like Hollywood stars. No, 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 no. In fact, just the opposite. They're stars like the stars in the sky. In the sky, there is the big sun, there's the smaller moon, and then there are really smaller stars that give light at night. The leaders in God's church aren't the sun, they're not the moon. But they do give some light, and they shine bright, and they illuminate the night to some degree. In that sense, they're the stars. That's what Revelation 1 tells us. Now, what about these seven spirits? It's, it's interesting, the number seven in Revelation. It harkens back to creation. Six days of work, 
one day of rest, a complete cycle of seven. Seven is the number of completion. And so when we talk about the seven spirits, the seven stars are in God's hand, the seven spirits, basically all of the work of the spirit is at the command of Christ. All of the leadership of the church is under the control and the command of Christ. When the church is good, it is both receptive to the work of the spirit that Jesus directs in the church, and the leadership of the church, both formal and informal, is in step with the direction of Jesus in his church. And Jesus holds them in his hand, meaning he's more powerful. It's really all about him, really. That's really what it's all about. But it's interesting that the number seven is used, because if you go in your Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 11, there's a passage in Isaiah chapter 11 that gives us a little bit of a hint of this multifaceted spirit of God. I don't know what you think about the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit in the, in the Bible is the operating force of God at work. It's multifaceted. It's multilayered. It's complex and beautiful and God's spirit can do whatever God wants to have happen. And in some places, God's spirit convicts people of sin. Interesting, last week, I got a few notes from some people saying, Ben, God convicted me of some stuff last week. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's not Ben. The Holy Spirit can convince people that you're a son or daughter of God. The enemy says you're not forgiven. The enemy says you're a sinner. The enemy says there's no future. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside and convinces you, no, you're a son of the king. You're an heir with Christ. You are set in heavenly places because of the blood of Christ. He convinces people of stuff. The Holy Spirit can call out in you the purpose of God in your life. It's a multifaceted working of God in the life of the church. Jesus said that he'd have to go to his father, but don't be afraid. It's good for him to go away. Did you know he said that? Jesus said exactly good that he's not here. Because when he went away, he sent the comforter, another role of the Holy Spirit. He sent the comforter to continue and to expand the work of God like the water covers the sea. The whole earth could be motivated by the Spirit and animated by the Spirit of God. And the Bible says in this passage that Jesus holds all the multifaceted, complex facet of the, facets of the Holy Spirit in his hand. It's at, the Holy Spirit is at the beck and command of Jesus. And Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 11 about the Spirit of God, he says the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him so it confirms Christ. That's one. That it is the Spirit of wisdom, two, and understanding, Three, it's the spirit of counsel, four, and might, five. It's the spirit of knowledge, six, and it's the spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. That's in Isaiah chapter 11, verse two. The spirit of God is multifaceted. Here, here's the point I'm making. Do you want to know the only hope that a dying church has? The spirit of God active in the church. Do you want to know the only hope that you as a disciple of Jesus really has? to make it in this dark world, to grow as a disciple, to press into all that God has for you, just to put it in a sentence, is to have the active work of the Holy Spirit involved in your life. The Holy Spirit animates and gives life and calls out the work of God in you. The Bible actually says it this way, that the Holy Spirit, when Jesus was on the earth, was with God's people. But when Jesus went away, the Holy Spirit now actually resides in you. What this means, let me make it perfectly clear what this means is, there's a lot about your life you can change in your own power. You can change your routine. You can change your sleep habits. You can change your diet. You can change your exercise. You can change your intelligence, at least your knowledge as you study. But when it comes to your spiritual life, there isn't one thing that you can do, not one thing you can do to change anything about your spiritual life without the power of the Holy Spirit coming alongside you. Here's what most people who have been married for at least five years already know. So if you've been married five years, you know this. See if you agree with me. You only argue by, uh, about four or five things. You only argue about four or five things. Now, you argue about it a hundred times a year. But the subjects are pretty much the same thing. I mean, you're cycling the same arguments over. Now, by the way, if you haven't been married yet five years and you didn't know that, start paying attention. You, I'm telling you the truth. You have the same fights over and over. And, over. and spiritually, spiritually, 
you're going to struggle with the same spiritual struggles, it, at least it appears to me, repeatedly in your life. Like, they don't go away the first time you slay the dragon. They don't. It's almost like Hydra. Some of you get that reference. You cut off the head and two grow back. Right? That's Greek mythology or Avengers Universe. Take, take your pick. Either way. You want to do that. Right? You cut off the head and two grows back. That's kind of the way spiritual struggles are. And there are sins. There are spiritual struggles that nip at your heels. And if you start paying attention to them, they're going to be similar ones. Like, Yours are different than somebody else's, but yours tend to cycle around. Let me make something clear to you. You are powerless in your own power to slay those dragons, to kill those demons. Only the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in your life, only the Holy Spirit of God will give you power, animate you, and give you life over the death that those things are trying to bring to you. The Bible makes it clear that the enemy of your soul's plan is to kill, steal, and destroy. But the power of God through the agency of the Holy Spirit rises up, creates a standard, a wall of protection against that, and actually can help you defeat and stand against the fiery darts of the enemy, as Paul calls them. You are incapable you are incapable of not sinning without the Holy Spirit in your life. And you're incapable of experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Bible says you can't even come to God unless the Spirit draws you? That's why when you're sitting in a church service and you begin to feel something. Like that's not bend. That's not manipulation. In our church, it's not even the right keys being played behind you. We try not to even like, use music at all to motivate people to make changes. Now, that's the power of the Holy Spirit saying, come on, a little closer. Come on, let go of that sin. Come on, confess that. Come on, deal with that. Come on, humble yourself here. And it brings life to people. And the only prayer that a dying church like Sardis had is that the manifold work of God in its complexity comes by the Spirit of God to a congregation. And the only hope you have is that the Holy Spirit comes in power and floods your life. Jesus said, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Then he says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Wake up. This is the sound of that text. Wake up. Get up. It's time. Time now. And it's interesting. He said you have a reputation, but your reputation doesn't match your reality. Years ago, Jill and I were dating, and there was a restaurant in Chattanooga about 30 minutes away from our college, Lee University, in case you don't know. It's a great school. Lee University. And um, it was called Grady's. This was back in the late 80s when everybody was going to the mall. Remember when everybody used to go to the mall? You like just go and walk around the mall? I don't and there would be, like, restaurants outside. So the Grady's was there, and it was the best restaurant. They had, like, the most fresh salads when you would order an entree. But with each salad, there would be a piece of this cheesy bread. Now, it was bread with butter and cheese, and it was baked, and it was melted and gooey. And basically, it was the most amazing and awesome experience of your life um, is really what that was like. And, um, it was so, and so we would go to Grady's literally and just, like, just to order cheesy bread, Right? And the service was good, and it was always clean. And the, the wait staff, they were, like, so incredibly service-oriented. Like, they were saying my pleasure before Chick-fil-A made it cool, you know. It was just their best place to eat. But over the course of a couple years, we noticed things started slipping. And every once in a while, there'd be, like, a little wilted lettuce in your lettuce bowl. But we're still telling our friends, Great Eats is our favorite place. It's the place to go. And the cheesy bread wasn't quite as cheesy and one time I ordered a hamburger and it was a little cold, so I very kindly said to the waitress, well, my burger's actually cold. And here's what she said to me. She's like, I'll go get the manager and he can deal with you. And I thought, well, something has shifted. Like, so the reputation didn't match the reality. That's what happened at Sardis. You have a reputation for being alive. You have a reputation for being a spirit-enthused church. But the truth is, you are dead. You're like in a coma. You're almost done. Wake up. Wake up. Now, that's not just Sardis, by the way. 
Did you know that 3,500 churches a year close their door in the United States? 3,500. That's over 60 a week. This week, 60 churches in America closed their doors. 80% of all churches in America are what are considered plateaued or declining. Entire denominations are folding. Some churches have embraced social change, but they've denied the power of the gospel. They've limited the work of the Spirit, and they've given themselves to other causes other than submission to the Word of God, and they're dying. That's not just the historical reality about that church. This is, if we're not careful, two generations from now at Four Corners Church. This is perhaps the church your grandmother went to. Sociologists study it, and they say churches have life cycles. And I get that. They do. There's a lot to learn from a sociological uh, study of, a, of churches and life cycles. Our church, at almost 14 years old, we're no longer a church plant, right? We no longer get the buy of not having it all put together. We've got to kind of get our junk together. That's what happens at about this age. People expect more. That's fine. That's all good. All that's over here. I'm talking about beyond the programming of church. At Sardis and in many churches in America today, the Spirit of God is not doing its work in the people's lives who make up the church. That sounds very judgy, doesn't it? In fact, it sounds a whole lot like this in the morning when I was in college. Like, that's just aggravating. Like, who are you to say that? It's not me. If you don't want to talk about America today, let's just stick with Sardis because, you know, it's a long time ago and it's not personal. Jesus looked at Sardis and said, you're dead. You're asleep. The Spirit of God is not breathing life into this place. You remember the Spirit of God? It was the Spirit of God in Genesis chapter 1 that hovered over the face of the water. And when God said, let there be light, and God created the heavens and the earth, and God separated the water from the land and filled it with living creatures and fruit of its kind... It was the Spirit of God, as God spoke, that did that work. It was the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost that came in and sat like cloven tongues of fire on the heads of people and animated their speech, and there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It was the Spirit of God on the vision that Ezekiel had of the dry bones. And when the Spirit and the breath of God blew over those bones, they regained their muscle and got reanimated and came back to life. This is the Spirit of God that has departed from the Sardis church. Six signs. Remember I told you your notes aren't going to align. Six signs of a dying church. Let me give them to you. The first one. You can write these down, not, whatever. If you take any next steps, I'll send you the other note. And uh, we'll get on with it, all right? But number one, six signs of a dying church. Number one, the Spirit has left the building. The Spirit has left the building. People's lives aren't being changed. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit isn't present. The worship is perfunctory and routine. The preaching is powerless and it's as if the words fall at the end of the stage if they have any life at all. There's a reliance sometimes on man's wisdom versus the spirit, as opposed to what Paul said in Corinthians, I did not come with persuasive words of man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the problem is a reliance on man's wisdom versus the spirit. Other times it's flat-out hidden sin, and there's been a rejection to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit such that he's still convicting, but the church can't hear it anymore. That's what happens when you say no to God's conviction over time. Your receptors get burned, and you can't hear it anymore. Sometimes churches like the church at Sardis are lulled into complacency because they've arrived at a place where they don't really need they believe the Spirit of God to show up to continue to thrive and grow. Now, I'm going to make an analogy. Don't stretch it too far, but there's some validity here. Sometimes churches can become so wealthy and well put together that, in effect, they can do church without much of God. If you ever get a choice to go to a wealthy church that can do church without God, 
or an impoverished church where the Spirit of God is flowing and the winds of the Spirit are blowing in the aisles, choose the poor one with the Spirit of God all day long because in five generations, this one's still going to be going. There isn't enough money in the world to keep a church going for five generations that's dead without the Spirit of God. People will decide for themselves, it's not worth my time. And it isn't. Church is not worth your time, your effort, or your money unless God's presence is present in the church. Because nothing of spiritual significance can happen without the Spirit of God. Let me give you sign number two of a dying church. There's no passion for prayer. A prayerless church is a powerless church. If you see a church moving mountains, let me tell you what's happening. Somebody somewhere is praying. As a dad, I am moved when my kids come to me and they make a passioned plea for what they want. Now, they don't always get what they want, but when they come to me and it's clear they know I'm a source of blessing in their life, they come to me and they know that I love them and they ask boldly for what they want, I love that. I love it when my kids come with passion and make requests for me. And your Heavenly Father loves that when you do that too. But when prayer ceases to be a mark in your life, and then let's add it up, 20, 30, 40% of the church perhaps is not praying, and the church effectively becomes a prayerless church, then the power of God is no longer at work in that church. God doesn't show up and do his work just because that's what we expect him to do. He makes it very clear that our prayers somehow move his hand. And if his hand isn't moving in your family, it could be nothing more than you're prayerless. And if his hand isn't moving in a church, it could be nothing more than there's not enough prayer going up. So it begs the question, how is your prayer life? It begs the question as a pastor, how is the prayer life of this church? Not to praise me, but because I believe this enough, I want to show you how much I believe it. Most every Friday or Saturday, most of the time on Saturday, I show up in this building, I come into this room, and I walk. And I pray. And you might be surprised how I, I'm glad nobody's here most of the time. Because I don't sound much like a pastor. Can I be honest with you for a minute? Now, even if you say no, I'm going to. That's okay. Here's what they sound like. God, tomorrow's Sunday. You know they're not coming. You know the weather's going to be too good. And some are going to stay out because the weather's too good. God, please don't let the weather be too good. God, you know the weather's going to be too bad. And some aren't going to come. God, whatever is that exact medium where we're just miserable enough to leave the house, would you let the weather be that on Sunday morning? That's what I pray. Seriously. I walk around. I touch the seats. God, I don't know who's going to sit in this seat. But I know this. I'm not a good enough preacher to change somebody's heart. So God, whoever sits here today, would you do your work in their life? God, would you... Would you infuse our worship with your spirit? Would you keep the distractions at bay so we could see a bigger picture of Jesus? I don't know all that God wants to do, but I know this, that he does it at the back end of prayer. And a prayerless church is a dying church. And a prayerless Christian is a dying Christian. They go together. And here, here's the truth. Even if we are a perfectly honoring, praying, praying church, our church can't pray enough for what God needs to do in your family. I can't pray enough for you. I can come alongside your prayers. But I can't pray enough to make up for your absence of prayer. Jesus said to the Sardis church, wake up. And if you don't want to wake up, it sounds like this. But if you want to wake up down deep, you know you need to wake up. That's a welcomed call. People who pray know the truth of the scripture when it says it's not by might nor by power, but it's by the spirit of God that God does his work. A dying church has no ear for the truth. Sardis must have had that problem. They, they had it at Ephesus. So Paul writes to Timothy, the pastor at Ephesus in 2 Timothy over and over and over again, the most recurring phrase in Timothy is, preach the word, Timothy. Preach the word, Timothy. Preach the word. 
Be instant, in season and out of season. Preach the word. The answer to most problems in most churches isn't better X, Y, or Z. It's the preached word of God boldly proclaimed and humbly received. It is the word of God that has the power to cut to the deepest parts of our lives and divides our spirit and our soul and reveals exactly what surgery God wants to do in our lives. But too many people don't have an ear for the truth. They don't like the truth. So Paul had to tell Timothy way back then, and it's true today, and if we're not careful, it'll be true at our church. He says to Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And then he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage. We only like one of those encouraging words. But that's, not what, that's not what Paul told Timothy. He said, correct people, rebuke people, and encourage people. Correct them. Call it out, man. And then he said, you have to do it with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Itching ears. Please me. Make me happy. Say what I want to hear. When that happens, when people don't have an ear for the truth, but they have itching ears, the church is dying if you have itching ears and you don't want to receive the truth of God's word, you're dying spiritually. So instead of being hard on sin, they're soft in the flesh. You don't hear words like the blood of Christ and repent. That's what happens in churches. And maybe for six months, a year, ten, if they're well healed, maybe twenty, it looks like things are good. But unless people's lives are being changed by the power of the Spirit, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. i got to be honest with you. I love you too much to tell you what you want to hear. I do. I knew when I started this church that people would wonder where my allegiances are. And I decided long before I decided to do this, when God called me to be a pastor and a minister and a teacher of God's word, that no matter who wrote my paycheck, I would not work for any man. So I'm a fully accountable to our board, but I do not work for them. And if at any point, you know, they think I'm, they would not do this. But if they were to think I was too bold, too whatever, fine, fire me. Yay! It'd be Okay. Truthfully, Four Corners, I love you too much to not tell you the truth. And I'm too afraid of God. And so in this church, you'll hear about the blood of Jesus. And you'll get called to repentance because hell is still hot. Sin is still dark and wrong. And Jesus is going to come back one day like a thief in the night. And he needs to find you awake, ready and waiting on him. Not asleep, not in slumber. And your blood will not be on my hands because I failed to tell you the truth. It will not. You can go find any number of churches in this city that won't talk like this. Good for you. Good for them. But not here. Not here. It is not loving to withhold the truth from somebody under the premise of mercy and grace and acceptance. Number four. There's a tolerance of sin in a dying church. At Ephesus, they lost their first love. At Pergamum, they compromised with the culture. At Thyatira, they were sleeping with Jezebel. And at Sardis, they were dead on arrival. So Jesus writes these words. If you look in your text, strengthen what remains and is about to die, he says to Sardis. Sardis. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. You don't need new information you got to remember what you've been taught and go back to it. That's called repentance. You don't need a new word from God. you got to follow the word of God he's already given you. Go back to what you have received and what you've heard, and then hold fast to it, and then here's our word, and repent. 
That's how life comes through the power of the Spirit. When we say to God, God, it was good that you called me to repent. You're a kind and loving God. Your alarm is not to infuriate me. Your alarm is not to frustrate me. Your alarm is to arouse me and to save me. That's what it's for. Number five, a dying church. In a dying church, there are factions and divisions. This happened at the Corinthian church. Here's how Paul wrote to them. Just see if you can relate to any of this in any of your church experiences. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who lived by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Now, sometimes people come to church and they're not all put together. I'm not all put together. And if you came to this church because your last experience was bad and you came here to heal, you're in the right place. But I want to be crystal clear with you. You are not given a hospital bed by Jesus so you could occupy it between now and when he comes. Your healing is meant to heal you so you could get up and change hats from that of a patient to that of a soldier. God didn't call you to a church just to get your fix. He called you to join the team, to put on your marching boots, to get up out of the bed of your misery and of your hurt and of your pain and become a wounded healer, a found person who finds people, a saved person who brings the message of salvation to others. It's not enough to come to church and get your fix. You've missed it. You got to come to church and get on board with the mission of Jesus. And here's what I've discovered for people who are not on board with the mission of Jesus and churches that aren't on board with the mission of Jesus, they're always fighting. Always. You know why? Because the vision of the gospel and the call of God on the church isn't bright enough. So everybody else's little kingdoms and little visions take prominence. So one church, one church. One church, one Lord, one baptism, one faith, the scripture says. We're not multiple churches in a building. We have one mission. It's right there on the wall. Go and baptize and make disciples. And that's your call, not just mine. Dying churches don't talk like that. We got to keep everybody happy. We got to smooth the fur. We got to lay it down in a way that doesn't offend. That's not church, that's a country club. Number six, dying churches stop taking risks and they stop pressing forward. In my Bible, faith is often spelled, as I read it, R-I-S-K. When we started this church, we wanted to do something so big that it was bound to fail unless God was in it. We wanted a big vision to reach every home in North Cincinnati with real love now through Christ. I can't do that. You can't do that. All of us together pulling all of our money can't do that. That only happens when we're obedient and the power of God shows up in the agency of the Holy Spirit to animate our work. I can't push back the forces of darkness. But I can stand bold in faith with the Holy Spirit in my life filling me up. And when that happens, I'm going to just tell you how the way I'm wired. When I feel that fullness of God. I mean, I, I want to like grab a water pistol and charge the gates of hell. That's how I feel. Like nothing can stop me. And when I am not animated that way, I know it's time for me to go back to God and hold my hands out like this and say, now, Father, fill me. Because I'm leaking. I leak. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said it. The reason he has to keep getting filled with the Spirit is because he leaks. And I'm going to tell you something. If D.L. Moody, who started Sunday school, who God used to bring a great revival in the early 1900s, late 1800s in this country, if D.L. Moody leaked the Spirit of God, you leak the Spirit of God too. You just do. And you regularly got to come to God and say, you know, God, fill me with your Spirit. I leak. I don't have what I need to accomplish what you're trying to do in my life. I can't barely hold myself together, let alone be an agent in your hands, a, a soldier in your army. It's part of your mission. I can't. I can't. I, you've got to fill me up, God. You've got to fill me up. Don't ever let it be said 
three generations from now, four generations from now, that four corners died, four corners slumbered, four corners went into a coma because when God hit the alarm, we were unwilling to be roused. There's evidence of that all over our country, not here, not here, not here. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to ask God to fill me. And I'm going to ask him to fill you. I'm going to ask you whatever that posture of prayer looks like for you. For some people it's this. For other people it's this. If you're not a Christian today, clearly I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Christians who need to be roused. In a moment, I'll talk to non-Christians. But this prayer right here, this is for God's spirit to fill, animate, overwhelm, flood, push out every work of darkness, every demonic force, everything that stands itself against the power and the truth of God. Now, if you want that in your life and in your family, bow with me right now. Father, we confess we cannot do it without you. God, the truth is I'm old enough, I don't even want to try anymore. I don't want to do it without you. I say with Moses, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. And so, Father, to the best of my ability, I humble myself before you. I pray your spirit would fill me. I leak, Lord. I leak. Fill me with your spirit, Father, but not just me. My brothers and sisters here too, Lord. You have by your spirit sounded the alarm and in some hearts today, I pray, God, that there would be a profound receptivity to your work, that your spirit would so overwhelm, it would so fill, it would so flood, it would so overflow that every work of the enemy would be pushed out. Every force of darkness would be pushed out. God, where there has been prayerless homes, I pray that this week there would be the echo in the hallways of the prayers of moms and dads pleading Jesus' blood over their children. I pray, God, there'd be prayer between husband and wife with joined hair, hands and wet eyes for vitality and life in their marriage. I pray, God, you would burden us with the souls of lost people. That we'd, we'd pull out every stop to make sure that the gospel goes forth in power. I pray we would not stop until every home in North Cincinnati has experienced all that you have for them, all the love that you have for them, all the truth that you have for them. I pray, God, that you would use us. Holy Spirit, fill our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you grab out your Connect card and let's uh, take a couple steps together. Remember that I wrote these next steps before I rewrote this message. So... Next step, A says, today I'm making Jesus my Savior and Lord. If you don't yet have a relationship with him, you have a little foretaste of how he wants to work in your life. You can check next step A, and in a minute when I pray, you can ask Jesus to forgive you, wash away your sins. And the Bible says that at that moment, his Holy Spirit will take up residence in you. He'll sit on the throne of your heart. That's language I use. That's not specific in the Bible, but he'll sit on the throne of your heart, and he'll be your Lord. He'll be in charge. Next step B says, today I'm choosing to be baptized. We have a big baptism coming up on uh, August 5th, one service, 10 o'clock. It's going to be awesome. If you haven't been baptized, go on public with your faith. You can check the box and start that conversation. Next step, C, is a prayer that's actually in your notes. It's a prayer about God searching your heart. And I, if you check the box, I'll send it to you. It says, I'll pray this prayer. Psalm 139, it says, God, search my heart, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart and see whatever dark, whatever wicked way might be in me cleanse me. Make it, I'll send you that passage. And you can pray it over yourself, over your family, over your home. I'm praying it over a church. God, search our church. Drive it out. Fill us with your spirit. Replace every bit of darkness with your light. Now, next step D is about our construction. We're almost done. And we can speed it up, but to do that, we've got to hire some help. So we either can keep working with volunteers or we can hire some help. So this is not for everybody. All right, This is not for everybody. But if you want you can give a one-time financial gift to help us speed up. And if you do, we're going to hire some contractors to get this work done a little bit more quickly than we're going to be able to do it without it. And if we don't, we're going to get it done anyway. So it's okay. But I thought I'd throw this out there and see if there are some folks that would like to write a check, an extra one, to help us get that work done a little bit more quickly. 
all right? And next week, I'll give you a big update on where we are, and the door will be cut in the lobby, and you'll be able to walk through and see a lot of it. We're close. We're just not quite there. And the next step, he says, hey, send me the link for the New Life uh, mission, for the golf outing, and all those other things we're talking about, and we'll send you all those links and sign up. Why don't you set that aside, and you call this church home. This is your opportunity to give an offering to support the ministry here. i got to give you some good news. Um, so uh, over the last couple of years, there's a couple in, in our church that um, have been living together and dating on again, off again, and had some personal stuff. And so they raised their hand and said they need some help. And so because you guys are generous and faithful to give, we were able to send them to some counseling. And we paid for it as a church. You, you did. That's what we're able to do here. It's really cool. So a couple weeks ago, I get a call from this guy, and he says, look, I need to make her an honest woman. We're tired of living together. We know it's not what God wants for us, and we don't have money to throw a big wedding. We'd like to do that in a couple years, maybe. But we're upside down financially. But we don't want to wait. Pastor, would you marry us? And I said, sure. Yeah, dude, that's honorable. Way to go. I'd love to. When do you want me to do it? He said, tomorrow. I was like, wait, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, we went and got a marriage license today. Can I show up at church tomorrow? So just like two and a half weeks ago, I stood right in that lobby. I did a 15-minute ceremony because you guys had given money to soften somebody's heart. The gospel was preached. They wanted to walk in obedience, and they made each other honest before God and the world. Yeah, they'll throw a party a couple years from now. But they wanted to honor Jesus with their lives. And I want to tell you, I'm thrilled to be a part of a church with that kind of generosity, that kind of boldness. Thank you for letting me be your pastor. It's a privilege. Let's pray about our next steps in our offering right now. Father, thank you for what you're doing. You are God, we are not. I pray, Lord, for the men and women in this room who are declaring, Jesus, wash away my sins. I have nothing to bring. I trust only the work of Christ on his cross and in his resurrection. I pray, Lord, for our next steps. I pray for our offering. Would you make them go far and wide? God, give us every resource we need to accomplish all that you've called us to do. I pray all this in the name of Jesus, God's strong and holy son. Amen and amen.